And on behalf of the old Bristol Historical Society, I'd like to not only welcome you, but thank you all very, very much for coming to this first, this first talk of our series of five talks about Bristol history. So uh, before I introduce Jody, I would like to just have a little commercial for the Old Bristol Historical Society. So the Old Bristol Historical Society is really not that old. We were formed only 18 years ago, in 2003, for the precise purpose of collecting and preserving and sharing, collecting, preserving, and sharing the history of our beloved town of Bristol. So over the last three years, a lot of very dramatic changes have taken place. With the acquisition of the old Poole Brothers Lumber Company and its historic mill, we are now fully engaged, fully engaged in preserving that mill, rebuilding it, as well as creating a brand new Bristol History Center in the Poole Brothers Retail Building. Also having an archival vault to store all of our historical documents and photos and journals and all the town records. And also creating a beautiful historical park there at Pinnacle Falls. So in order to do this, we are launching, or have launched a long time ago, a campaign. <laughs> that campaign is to raise $250,000 to do all of those things. So we have raised so far about $175,000. We need about seventy dollars to $75,000 more. So if there is anyone here who would like to write us a check <laughs> for $75,000, we would be very grateful. But also, if anyone would be willing to make a contribution, we would be deeply, deeply grateful as well. Also, if any would like to volunteer your time and talents and services, we would love to have that. We have about 40, 50 different volunteers doing all kinds of things, rebuilding the mill and doing all these things. So if you would like to join them, we would be delighted to have you do it. So that's my little commercial. Thank you for letting me share. And we're looking for those checks as soon as possible. <laughs> So tonight I'd like to introduce Jody. She really needs no introduction here in the New Harbor area. She's known as Jody Holmes here, but Jody Holmes Bachelor is her name. But nevertheless, Jody is a native daughter of New Harbor. Went to Bristol School, Lincoln Academy, went on to Colby College where she took a, a Bachelor of Arts in French. Went on then to the University of South Carolina where she did a master's degree in library and information science, and then became a librarian at the Haldale Middle High School in Farmingdale. In nine, not 1970, right? In 2013, in 2013, she was honored as the main school librarian of the year for her work at Haldale School. But Joni is married and has two adult children and lives in Brunswick, but we are so proud to have her as a member of the Old Bristol Historical Society. Actually, her book on Samoset is going to be published in 2022 by the Down East Press. So would you join with me now and give a warm welcome to Jody. Good evening, thank you for coming. Uh, I'd like to start tonight with a simple land acknowledgement. Um, we are on the traditional homeland of the Wawanak people. So it's appropriate that we recognize that they took care of this land for thousands of years. I started thinking about writing a book about Samoset about six years ago. Originally, I was just going to write a picture book because I didn't think there was very much information about Samoset. It turns out I was wrong. So my project has turned into a 250-page historic nonfiction book for adults. I recognize that I am not the ideal person to tell Samoset's story 
It should be told by a Wawanak person. But the Wawanak are not here. And it's been 400 years and still the story has not been told. So I have tried my best to do justice to their history, though I know it is still far from perfect. The book could not have happened without the work of many, many people, all the scholars who have written about this history. Uh, it was their work that has allowed me to put the pieces of the story together. Even so, I had to be careful not to perpetuate some of the past mistakes. I don't know how many times I read that uh, Samoset was kidnapped and taken to England, or that Samoset was Squanto. Those things are incorrect, by the way. Um, then I had to do the, the hardest thing of all. I knew I had to ask Wabanaki people to read my book. I realized that I was opening myself up to some terrific criticism, but it was the only way that I could know if I was even close to getting the story right. So I asked um, Chris Newell, who is Passamaquoddy and the director of the Abbey Museum in Bar Harbor, and James Francis Sr., who is the Penobscot tribal historian, to read the manuscript. Um, they were both tremendously helpful. They noticed things that, that I, as a non-native person, could not know, uh, and rightfully pointed out instances when I was being culturally insensitive. So the book is much better for their help. So people have asked me, what did I use for my sources? Um, there were many. I read books and articles, letters, court documents, deeds, um, maps. I did site visits. All these things helped fill in the pieces of the story. And I'd like to thank my fellow librarians for providing me with many, many sources. But primary sources were critical and the most illuminating. This is a list of just the few that I used. So that's a little background about the process. And what I want to share with you is that this story was so much more complex than I could have imagined when I started. And I only have time to give you highlights tonight, and I'm sorry about the things that I have to leave out. I also apologize that I have to refer to my notes, because if I don't, I will forget everything I wanted to tell you. So I want to cover a lot of material. If you're ready, we'll get started. OK, so this map should help you get your bearings um, geographically and get to know some of the terminology that I'll be using. Uh, the word Wabanaki is translated in English as the Dawnland, and the Wabanaki are the people of the Dawnland. I use this term because it is the easiest um, term to use to identify this group of people and because it's used today. These people formed an alliance in the late 17th century, which actually would have been after Samus that died, um, to fight off um, an invasion of Mohawks. So they were the, the Micmac, the Passamaquoddy, the Maliseet, the Penobscot, and then west of the Penobscot, which would include New Hampshire, part of Vermont, were collectively known as the Abenaki which is kind of confusing. They mean the same thing, Wabanaki, Abenaki, just slightly different dialects. But the Abenaki are a subset of the Wabanaki. Samoset was a Wawanak who lived in Pemaquid, which is number 15 on the map. And Wawanak territory was roughly from the Kennebec River to the St. George River. And there were many communities, uh, mostly probably a village at least on every river. And uh, when I use the term Wawanak, I'm, I'm usually referring to the Pemaquid Wawanak. And I will switch to the term Wabanaki when it may refer to people that are outside Wawanak territory. So let's take a look at what Samoset's life would have looked like before contact with Europeans. All the literature puts his lifespan from around 1590 to 1653, but we really don't know. I think that birth year is based on the fact that most people thought he was around 30 years old when he walked into Plymouth Plantation. So if we assume that that's accurate, <clears throat> then he would have grown up for the first 15 years of his life having no contact with Europeans, 
So how did the Wawanuk live? Their lives would have revolved around the seasons. And so in the spring, we would find them at their village in Pemaquit, and they would probably plant crops, the three sisters most likely, <clears throat> excuse me, corn, beans, and squash. Uh, excavations that have been done at Pemaquid have revealed uh, bits of charred corn and a pestle for grinding corn, so uh, it would appear that they were at least growing that. Um, and that would mean they had more food security than if they were just hunting and gathering their food. So women probably worked the garden, um, and in the spring, men might have used that time to clear new fields or repair their canoes or their tools uh, or build new ones. They would have lived in wigwams like you see here. Uh, Chris Knoll was quick to tell me that this was probably a winter wigwam because it was covered with birch bark. And in the summer, they would have probably covered them with woven reeds to let the air flow through. As we know, spring was also a uh, time for the alewife and the salmon run. Fish were much more numerous in pre-colonial times. So they were a tremendous source of protein, and especially important because they could be smoked and preserved for later. It was also a good time for hunting bears because the bears would come to the rivers to feed on the fish as well, and uh, they could hunt the bears. <clears throat> so we think people from different villages came together when the fish were running, which was kind of like a festival. They had plenty of food, so they would have feasts, uh, they enjoyed some good competition with each other, races, wrestling matches, things like that. Played lots and lots of games and enjoyed visiting their family and friends. And then Sam Asset and his family would return to their camp in Pemaquid, hopefully with a large supply of, of food for the months to come. So in the summer, <clears throat> the men would fish in the ocean. They would also harvest oysters and clams and mussels, and apparently lobsters were so plentiful that you could practically scoop them out of the ocean. <coughs> so women continued to work in the garden, but they'd also go out and hunt for berries and, and food, um, other plants and herbs that they could eat, as well as use for medicine. And this is a picture of a right whale, which can grow to the size of a school bus. We know that Wabanaki people hunted whales and with bows and arrows and harpoons made out of sharpened bone because there's a description of a whale hunt in one of the early English journals. So I think that's pretty incredible. So like the spring and the fall, it was a busy time for stockpiling food. The men would do a lot of hunting, like turkey, deer, bears, uh, and trapping, uh, mostly beavers, uh, but smaller game as well. Migrating birds were a huge source of food in the 16th and 17th centuries. Passenger pigeons, which are now extinct, used to fly in flocks of millions of birds. People would say that the sky would just grow dark when they would fly overhead. <clears throat> so women and probably children would bring the harvest in and they would save the seeds for the following spring. And the nuts were dropping off the trees, so they would gather those. Um, women would also prepare the hides of the animals that their husbands hunted and use that to make their clothing and shoes and many other things. In winter, the Wawanak would follow the food supply. Hunting was better inland, so they would paddle up river and they would break into smaller groups, um, probably family or maybe extended family groups. Uh, and they did this so that they wouldn't overlap their hunting territories. And we don't know, know exactly where their winter camps were, but you know, I imagine that they, uh, they were somewhat spread out on the riverfronts. Winter was hard, but they had fun as well. They would play shinny, which is like ice hockey and used toboggans to go sledding. And they played a game called snow snake, which was this, they would carve a stick that looked like a snake, and they would take it to the top of a hill, and then they would ice the hill and throw their sticks down the hill. And whoever's stick went the farthest got to collect all the sticks from that throw. <clears throat> so winter nights were long, and it was a good time to tell stories around the fire. 
The Wabanaki became terrific storytellers, and their favorite subject was Gluskab, who was their giant mythical hero, who taught the Wabanaki people the skills that they needed to survive. And these stories would teach lessons to the children. Uh, they would pass down their culture and their history this way. And Wabanaki people still love to tell Gluskab stories today. So we see the rhythm of their lives. They moved to take advantage of the bounty of every season. They spent time with their family and friends, and they lived a very active, healthy lifestyle. They were intimately connected with the land that they lived on and the creatures that lived on it as well, and their world was in balance. And then the Europeans came. The Penobscot apparently described the first ship that they saw as a great white swan coming from the east. So Europeans came to America for lots of reasons. Uh, by then, ship and navigation technology had improved, so they could leave the coast and hopefully find their way back again. But their main motivation was money. They were looking for gold and silver. They were looking for that northwest passage to Asia. And they were looking for natural resources that they had depleted at home, like timber and fish and whale oil. But what really surprised me was that it was a fashion craze for hats that turned Samoset's world upside down. <laughs> Beaver felt hats had become so popular that European traders had essentially wiped out their beaver populations. Everybody wanted a beaver felt hat, from royalty to the man in the street. And this was the fashion for over 300 years. The beaver barely survived this onslaught. But there were plenty of beavers in America, and the fur trade would soon dominate the lives of the Wabanaki people. So as far as we know, the Wawanak first met Europeans in 1605. This was the expedition of Captain George Weymouth, and it was documented by one of the passengers, James Rosier, who published a book about the voyage. It includes the very first descriptions that we have of Wawanak people. So Weymouth and his crew dropped anchor at the George's Islands, which is marked by Allen Island on the map. Eleven days later, they were visited by Wabanaki people. Rosier noted some uh, pretty fun and fascinating facts in his book, that the Wawanak loved sugar candy. And they laughed at the, the first time they saw their reflections in a mirror. I thought this was very clever. They made their clothing in pieces so they could tie on their sleeves and their leggings and take them off as they needed. Uh, they were fascinated by handwriting, which would have been the, the first time they had seen it. Rosier, they noticed Rosier was scratching uh, something down every time uh, they told him the word for something. And they quickly realized that this was helping him remember what the words were. So they would bring him uh, a flower or uh, something else, a bush, and watch him write it down. He also said that these were a people of exceeding good invention quick in understanding and ready capacity. So a couple of the inventions that he mentioned were, uh, he was extremely impressed by their bows, terrific craftsmanship, he said, uh, and their birch bark canoes, which he said the Wawanak men were able to paddle circles around uh, the English men in their small boat. <laughs> so the initial reactions between the Wabanaki people and the English were very friendly. But Weymouth wanted to trade for furs, and the Wawanak didn't have many. They weren't yet in the business of, of trapping and hunting more than they needed. So they offered to introduce him to their great sachem, who they said had lots of furs. So this great sachem was Bashabes, who was an important figure in this period of Maine's history. He was the leader of an alliance uh, of people that spanned all the way from Penobscot Bay down to Saco. So you can see it was a huge territory. And it was a territory called Mawushin, 
Uh, and I believe my mother and those of her generation attended the Mavushan School on New Harbor Hill. And this is where the name comes from. So this meeting between Captain Weymouth and Bashabes didn't exactly go as planned. So without getting into all the backstory, uh, Weymouth felt that he had been betrayed and he left before meeting Bashabes and without getting any furs. Then he decided it was time to go back to England, but not before taking some of the native people with him. So Weymouth and Rosier hatched a plan to kidnap some of the Wawanak. They, would, they came to the ship the next day, thinking the English were their friends. The Wawanak were, just weren't expecting this kind of treachery, and they were easy prey. The English managed to abduct five Wawanak men, and then several days they headed back to England. Sadly, there are lots of accounts of Europeans who kidnapped indigenous people and took them back to Europe, where they would either sell them as slaves or just keep them as a curiosity. We don't exactly know what Weymouth had in mind when he kidnapped these men, um, and they ended up being used as guides and interpreters for other English adventurers who would come to America. So the five kidnapped men, and I think this is incredible, we have their names, were Tahanido, Amoret, Skikawaros, Manido, and Sasakomoit. That's how Rosier wrote their names. That's how I refer to them. But you'll see lots of different spellings of their names. Uh, and that was a result of how difficult it was for the English to understand the language. Um, we know that the men were from Pemaquid because two of them returned home there. So these five men were carried across the sea to the port city of Plymouth, and then two of them were taken on to London. I try to imagine what it must have been like for them to see an English city. This is an illustration of London from 1616, so very close to that time. And you can see it's a huge city. It had buildings that were several stories high. It had bridges going across the river. There were men riding on horses. Everything must have been a wonder. So the five captives uh, were shared between two important men of that day. They were Sir John Popham, who was the Lord Chief Justice of England at the time, and Sir Ferdinando Gorges, who was the commander of the fort at Plymouth. Both of these men became fascinated with the territory of Mawushan, which was described to them by the captives. And they worked together with the idea of setting up a colony there, which of course was the famous Popham colony named after Sir John. The plan was to use the Wawanak captives as their guides and the middlemen in Mawushan, but things did not go according to that plan. Only two of the captives, Tahanido and Skikawaros, made it back to Pemaquid. The other three never made it home. The Popham colony story is huge, and it's really intriguing, and it deserves much more time than I can give it here. Uh, so I'm just going to make a couple of points about it. So the location they chose was Sagatahawk, which was the mouth of the Kennebec River. And this is an illustration of what the colony probably looked like. Uh, in the lower right-hand corner, you can see uh, a ship there which would have been the Virginia, which was the very first ship built in America. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, there is an organization in Bath called Maine's First Ship, and they are building a replica of the Virginia, and they hope to launch it this year. So we know that the Wawanak visited the Popham colony at least twice. Uh, and apparently, their objective for visiting was to set up a meeting between the English and Bashabas, who was the Mawushan sachem. We'll find out that Bashabas had good reason to pursue a meeting with the English. He needed their help. Because while the English were busy building their colony, a war among the Wabanaki people had erupted on the coast of Maine. This passage describes the Wawanak returning from a battle 
they just happen to randomly meet them in, on the uh, Pashipskog, which we think is the Sheepskit River. Sam Asset was now an adult. He would have been around 17 years old, and he would have fought in the war. So the Popham colonists struggled through a, a frigid winter. It was a colder winter than anybody could ever remember. And after their president died that February of 1608, everything began to unravel. The new president of the colony began to mistreat the Wabanaki people, and their two Wawanak interpreters refused to help them when they needed food and supplies. Now this is really an oversimplification, but there were many reasons that the English decided to pack up and return to England that fall. The, co the colony had failed. But of course, the end of the Popham colony didn't mean that the, the English stopped coming to America. So giving up on the idea of a colony for the moment, Sir Ferdinando Gorges switched the focus to fishing. Uh, he and uh, another man, Sir Popham's son, sent boats to this area for the next several years. That meant the Wawanak got used to seeing English fishermen around their home. And as long as, as long as they didn't try to build another settlement, it, it appears that they got along just fine. So this would have been when and how Samoset learned to speak English. But there was trouble in Mawushan territory. I mentioned earlier a war, and that was the Mi'kmaq War, which lasted almost a decade uh, between the Mi'kmaq, who lived in that area on the right, um, Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, a big part of New Brunswick, between the Mi'kmaq and the Mawushan Alliance. And there had been uh, bad feelings and animosity between them for many, many years, but it broke out into a full-scale war in 1607 with the Battle of Sako. This war ended up being a turning point in, in history for Wabanaki people because the French, who had built a colony at Port Royal in Nova Scotia, were allies of the Mi'kmaq and gave them guns to fight in the Battle of Sako. So this would have been the first time that native people would have used guns in war. The warfare before that time did not, not, did not result in a great loss of life but gunshot wounds were much more deadly. Now the, now the Mamushin Wabanaki had to get the same weapons so they could be on equal footing with the Mi'kmaq. That was why Bashabas was so anxious to meet with the English. He needed to make an alliance with them so he could get those weapons as well. So we believe that the war ended with a Mi'kmaq victory when Bashabas was killed in battle around 1615. But unfortunately, they, there was much more trauma to come. And this was the epidemic of 1616 to 1619. I think maybe only now that we ourselves have lived through a pandemic can we begin to imagine the horror of what came to be known as the great dying. The, the COVID-19 death rate worldwide is less than 4%. Um, and we know how, how it's uh, spread, we know what causes it, we know how to protect ourselves, we know how to treat it, mostly. But the Wabanaki knew none of those things. The death rate during this epidemic was sometimes as high as 75%. And yet the Europeans were not getting sick. So Native people thought that they had angered you know, their great spirit. And Europeans, on the other hand, felt that their god had cleared the land of the savages just for their benefit. It was around this time that Samoset became the Sagamore, or the leader of Pemaquid. Now we think there may have been as few as 20 survivors from the epidemic, which, which meant that there were very few men left to protect the village. And even though the war was over, the Mi'kmaq continued to come down the coast and raid for many years after that. How was Samoset supposed to protect his people? It seems like an extraordinary time for him to leave Pemaquid, but that's exactly what he did. In 1619, the epidemic is just subsiding. 
he left for Massachusetts. We don't know why, we don't know how he got there, but he was gone for almost a year. Why did Samoset go to Plymouth and how did he get there? Those were the two questions I really wanted to answer for myself. But the truth is, we, we really don't know. Um, but I think that the answer lies with Tisquantum, or Squanto as we learned in school. Uh, Tisquantum was an indigenous man from Patuxet, which became known as Plymouth. And uh, like the men from Pemaquid, he was kidnapped by the English, eventually ended up in England, and he was there for several years. But he got the chance to come back to America with an English explorer who brought him to Monhegan Island at least twice, which I think is a coincidence that is too great to ignore. It's, it's a complicated story, but I think that Samoset met Tisquantum on Monhegan, and it was Tisquantum who convinced him to go to Plymouth. The passage here by William Bradford, who became the governor of Plymouth, shows you what the Plymouth settlers expected indigenous people to be like. And they expected them to be cruel, barbarous, treacherous, not content just to kill. They delight in tormenting people in the most bloody manner possible. And that quote goes on in much more gory detail from there. I just would like to say that there's no evidence that the Wawanak or the Wabanaki people treated their prisoners this cruelly. Uh, but the passage, I think, helps us understand the mindset of the colonists. Their first encounter with indigenous people was on Cape Cod, where uh, a group of the English were scouting for a location. They woke up in the morning, and they were attacked by the Nauset people who lived in the area. No one was killed, but it, it certainly confirmed their fears that native people were violent. They obviously realized that this was not a safe place to settle, so they continued on to Plymouth. But it was a dreadful winter. Um, half of the colonists died that winter from malnutrition or disease or maybe exposure. All through that winter, they could hear native people around them and they could see their fires, but nobody approached. They felt terribly vulnerable, so worried uh, that they would bury their dead in the middle of the night so that native people could not see how many of them had died. Then on March 16, 1621, Samoset walked into their settlement, uh, boldly, as the colonists said. And he headed directly for a group of men who were mustered together, probably with their muskets, at one end of the uh, settlement. Now, this was a tense moment because Samoset was holding his bow and two arrows, so he was armed. And I think it would have been instinctive for them to shoot. But before they could react, he, he spoke to them in English. He greeted them. He smiled. And it must have been quite a shock. So if you Google Samoset, <laughs> some of these illustrations will come up of that very first meeting. None of these is historically accurate, and I don't think anybody has ever done an accurate depiction of him. According to um, the two accounts that were written by William Bradford and another colonist, Edward Winslow, Samoset talked with the colonists for hours, and he was friendly, he was open, they asked many questions, which he answered freely. He told them he came from Monhegan which was interesting. He told them that because that was a place that English people knew about. And then he told them about Patuxet, which is where they were, and how the people there had died in the epidemic. He asked for beer, and then he ate their food, and he seemed perfectly, perfectly comfortable talking with these foreigners. So comfortable, in fact, that when they tried to get rid of him that evening, he wouldn't go. Now, I love this detail because he would not be brushed aside but insisted on staying the night and being treated like a guest, like an equal. Samoset did two things in particular, which helped the settlers begin to trust native people. Uh, the, the colonists asked him uh, that when indigenous people would visit the settlement to leave their weapons outside 
And then the other thing they asked was they had lost some tools in the woods. The Wampanoag people of the area must have picked them up. They asked that they return them. On his next visit, Samoset complied with both requests. Then he arranged a meeting with Usa Mekwen, who we usually um, know as Massasoit. Uh, that was actually his title. The word Massasoit in Wampanoag means great sachem. His name was actually Usa Mekwen. So this was the famous meeting between uh, the Wampanoag and the Plymouth settlers, where they agreed to be friendly with one another and come to each other's aid if they were ever attacked by an enemy. And this peace that they forged that day was actually a treaty, uh, was kept for the entire length of Usamequin's life. Uh, shaky at times, but they managed to keep the peace. And I don't think Samoset deserves, uh, I, th I don't think he receives enough credit for the diplomatic role that he played in Plymouth. If we think about it, he calmed the settlers' fears, and he laid the foundation for friendly relations with them. He established trust with them, and he showed the colonists that native people were far from barbaric savages, and he insisted on being treated as an equal. I think that the colonists had to uh, readjust their opinion of native people after they met Samoset. So he left for uh, Maine soon after that, but we all know this is not the end of his story. We next find Samoset back at home here in Pemaquid uh, with a wife and a son. I think it's possible that he found a wife when he was in Plymouth and may have been a reason for going there in the first place. Uh, meanwhile, back here in Pemaquid, the Wawanak were recovering from the epidemic, the war, and all of that. So in the 1620s, we have small numbers of settlers who begin to arrive on the peninsula. This is obviously not a picture of John Brown <laughs> from 1625. Uh, it's Jeff Miller, who volunteers at Colonial Pemaquid. And I took this picture of him uh, demonstrating his blacksmith, uh, blacksmith skills during a reenactment in 2019. But John Brown was a blacksmith and a mason, and he came to Maine with his wife, Margaret, sometime before 1625, and settled in New Harbor. And I think this is kind of interesting, because this would have been the first time that Wallanock women could meet a European woman. And I can, I can imagine that Margaret was swarmed by you know, excited women and children. Uh -huh who were so curious about what she looked like and how did she dress and how did she cook. Of course, Margaret had to be resourceful because there was no steady supply of ships coming to Pemaquid yet. And she probably did all the, the child care, the cooking, the sewing, like, like the Wawanak women did. Uh, but gardening work she may have shared with John because English, Englishmen were usually farmers. They would have built a small house like this one that was recreated at Colonial Pemaquid. And it would have probably consisted of just one room, uh, maybe with a sleeping loft for future children. Would have had a fireplace at one end, and it was probably a pretty drafty place in the winter. Now, John Brown is well known because he supposedly purchased the entire Pemaquid Peninsula from Samoset. This is the text of the deed, and don't worry, I won't read it. But if it's authentic, then Samoset and the other Sagamore who signed it, Anungawit, would have been the very first indigenous people to sell land to Europeans. However, the Samoset deed is widely believed to be a forgery. And after looking at all the evidence I could find, I would agree. I think it's likely that um, Samoset and John Brown were good friends and that Samoset was happy to share land with Brown because after all there weren't really very many Wawanak and there was a lot of land. And it could be mutually beneficial, they could trade with each other, maybe help each other out in other ways too. And as far as the 1625 deed goes, John Brown's great-grandchildren, 
wanted to make a claim to the land about 100 years later. And they needed a deed to prove that they owned it. And for many reasons, uh, the deed that they presented for registration in 1720 appears to have been written in 1720 and not in 1625. Now, Samoset would sign three more deeds, none of which are believed to be forgeries. But his last deed is just a fragment of a deed, but he left us something very special. His signature. So the old hunter signed his name with a bow and arrow. I didn't find this until many years into this project, into my research. And I have to tell you, when I saw it, it just took my breath away. Uh, I think I cried a little when I saw it. Um, it was like him reaching out to me through time. And I would love to find this original. I'm still trying to track it down. So if we move on a little bit later, in um, 1631, Pemaquid is becoming a settlement. We have our good friend, Sir Ferdinando Gorges, giving a patent of land in Pemaquid to two businessmen from Bristol, England. They were Robert Aldworth and Giles Elbridge. Um, they were already successful businessmen in England uh, with an international trade business, and they wanted to, do, to expand to America. So they sent their agent, who was Abraham Shirt, over to Pemaquid and asked him to build a trading post and a settlement for, him, for them. So they would load their ships in England with supplies. They would be settlers, hopefully, and trade goods and animals, cattle, that sort of thing. And then Shirt would fill those same boats back up uh, with goods from here, like timber and furs and fish. Uh, masts for ships would have been popular, and send them back and business began to thrive. This would have been a new era for the Wabanaki people because before this time, uh, they had to paddle up and down the coast looking for ships to trade with. But now that there was a trading post rate at Pemaquid, they could trade there. Uh, as long as Abraham Shirt and other agents uh, stocked the goods they wanted and treated them fairly, this, this would have worked well. So around this time, we think that there were probably um, at least 100 people in the area. And the settlement was, was growing, but it wasn't growing terribly fast. Because Maine had trouble attracting settlers. It was, it was kind of viewed as the wild frontier. Um, and we can lay the blame for that at Sir Ferdinando Gorges's feet. Because he had never really been successful at establishing government here and law and order. Um, no clergy wanted to work here. So it made it a rather unattractive place to live for God-fearing families. And uh, in addition to that, Pemaquid was right next to the French territory of Acadia, their mortal enemies with whom they were constantly at war. And then we had another decade of tragedy and trauma. Because Pemaquid was doing so well, they were prospering here, it was ripe for plunder by pirates. So this is James Nelson. If you haven't seen him play Dixie Bull at Colonial Pemaquid, I hope you get the chance. It's great fun. Dixie Bull's story is really um, not terribly tragic, more fun, actually. Um, but we have to remember that after his raid, people in the area were, act were, were afraid, and they were unsettled. They didn't know who might raid them next. And then in 1633 to 1634, another epidemic swept through New England. This time we know it was smallpox. I don't think the death toll was quite as high in Maine as it was in 1616. But I can imagine that the fear of another disease like this would just linger, as well as the feeling that their gods were punishing them. And it was a trauma you, you just couldn't forget. Those who got sick and didn't die were often horribly scarred, and sometimes smallpox would cause blindness. Then in 1635, they're just recovering from the smallpox epidemic, and the great colonial hurricane hit the coast with 100 mile per hour winds and 20 foot storm surges. Trees were just being ripped out of, you know, out of the ground or snapped like twigs. 
The angel Gabriel, which was a, a, a ship that was owned by Giles Elbridge, had arrived just before the storm. Um, and luckily, most of the passengers had disembarked, but there were still a few aboard. And when that storm hit, uh, the ship just broke apart and sank, and four or five people were drowned. It just seems like crisis defined Samoset's life. And though we got through that decade without more disasters, things did not get easy for the Wabanaki. Um, in 1642, civil war broke out in England, which meant uh, the migration like by settlers coming here stopped as well. And this caused a huge recession, which meant that the prices for the Wawanox furs dropped dramatically. They had a hard time getting the goods that they needed, especially guns and ammunition, which they used for hunting. They had, by this time, given up using bows and arrows for hunting and for their livelihood. So by the 1640s, the pressure is just increasing on the Wabanaki. Um, besides the stress of the recession, they had overhunted their stock of animals, um, and it was becoming much harder to find the deer, the moose, the beavers especially, that were the basis of their livelihood. Uh, they were being cheated often by English traders, and they were being pressured to sell their land. The Wabanaki people began to realize that once they had no furs to trade and no land to sell, they were going to be in a very difficult position. So it, it was a very low moment for them. And this may have contributed to a problem with alcohol. Alcohol, as we know, um, would become a serious issue for indigenous people. Traders and other people as well tended to push alcohol so they could take advantage of native people. They would get them to sign deeds or run up debt at the trading posts, uh, among many other things. But the Wabanaki found help in an unexpected place, with the French. <laughs> this came as such a surprise to me, because I did not think that the French were going to be part of this story. But if we want to know what happened to the Wabanaki and actually all of the Wabanaki people, we have to understand their relationship with the French. Uh, and this will explain why the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, the Maliseet, and the Mi'kmaq continue to live on some of their tribal lands today, and the Abenaki people do not. So as the Wawanak's relationship with the English just got worse, became more dysfunctional, they began to look to the French for a safe haven. They heard that there were Jesuits living near Quebec, and they had, and they had started a mission there, and that they were working with native people to eradicate the evils of alcohol. So the Wawanak joined with other Abenaki people, uh, and they went to the French missions to look for sanctuary. Now, for the next few decades, uh, they went back and forth. They came back home um, and continued to spend time in Maine. But this connection with the French would just grow stronger and stronger. So I remember hearing an interview with, um, with Ken Burns and his team after they finished the Civil War project. And they talked about how difficult it was to put in the sound effect of the shot that killed Abraham Lincoln. Because up until that moment, until they put in the sound of the shot, he was still alive. So I could begin to understand what they were talking about. Um, it's kind of emotional and hard to write the death of Samoset. And you spend so much time with your subject, and they are present with you all the time. It was hard to end his life. So we don't know when or how Samoset died or where he's buried. Um, he signed two deeds in 1653, so it would have been after that. And legend has it that he's buried on Louds Island, which might be right because he seemed to uh, be friends with the Brown family through the rest of his life. And uh, the, the Brown family lived in Rhode Island, uh, Round Pond and on Louds Island. So 
What is Samoset's legacy? Was he a hero for protecting his people? Or did he sell out to the English? Of course, there's just too much we don't know about his life to make a judgment. But I think my feeling is that he did what he needed to do um, to keep his people safe. He did what was best for the Wawanak. They made an alliance with the English early on when they needed guns to fight in the Mi'kmaq War. And then he kept that alliance strong so his people would continue to be protected um, and to get the trade goods that they had come to rely on. So by any measure, his life was extraordinary, not just because of that famous walk into Plymouth Plantation, but because of what he and his people lived through. Samoset was probably the last Sagamore of Pemaquid to remember what life was like before Europeans came to Pemaquid. He would have started his life as a hunter-gatherer using stone tools. And he survived the Mi'kmaq War, the epidemics, and with every disaster, with every hardship, with every change that came, he and his people adapted and they persevered. And there are Wawanak descendants alive today. After Samoset's death, um, relations with the English just deteriorated further and further, which would eventually lead to six wars. Pemaquid was burned to the ground twice, and it never managed to return to its former glory. The English eventually drove all the Abenaki off their lands, and they either moved north permanently to Canada or um, or they integrated with other native communities, I think mostly the Penobscot and the Passamaquoddy. So Samoset's story and the story of the Wamanak people is unique, but I think it's similar to what other indigenous people would have experienced during the, this period of colonization. And I believe it's important that we're honest with ourselves about this history and the part that our ancestors may have played in it. I think if we do that, we'll begin to honor the memory of those who were here first. So thank you for coming. Thank you for your kind attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have.